saw the beagle. Okay. So it says on this path of cognitive development for us, we need building blocks that have meaning for us. See, it's meaning that we, we deal with. Right? In order to understand something, we have to translate it into a meaning and a framework. So we, if we want to do movement in new domains of cognition, we have to lay a foundation. We have to build some structures, some little building blocks or toy blocks or something. The same kind of thing we do with, with children. We put them on the floor and we give them these blocks and we say, go ahead, assemble something. And in the act of trying to assemble some things, they gain cognitive development within themselves, as you, most of you know. Um, and they build something. Well, I think that's the way it is for us with respect to these other domains. And to, to perform, to give certain kind of results, let's say with a pH machine, to increase the pH by one unit. Mm -hmm. when it, as it gets there, what it does is the deltrons allow the development towards the equilibrium counterpart in reciprocal space. Mm -hmm. But once it's in reciprocal space, which is a frequency domain, it means it's everywhere in the world at least, maybe on um, the Pleiades or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Long way, long way away. But once it's there, then you now have in your mind the picture where the, the conjugate, okay, which, which was slowly built in reciprocal space, that is in the same location as the Italian site with its measuring continuous measurement of pH. Now, in order to bring about thermodynamic equilibrium, it starts, the deltrons start going across that interface between domains, and it's as if the IIED is right there. That's and so awesome. it manifests the result. That is that's, that's how these things can occur, uh, and, I, and ultimately in a very mathematical way. Sure, okay. sure. Well, you know, um, <coughs> normally, for those who are not necessarily uh, enlightened would say, well, this is miraculous. And even though I'm hearing it and understanding it, comprehending it, and, and absolutely I'm uh, buying into the science, it does seem miraculous, but this is the norm for human potential. It is the norm. I think I like the statement that Arthur C. Clarke made. Whenever there is a technology sufficiently beyond the norm, it seems like magic. It must be considered. It's mostly considered as magic. Mm -hmm. And I and I say uh, it looks like magic until you develop the proper reference frame of understanding yes. to look at that result and see its lawful nature and see it as being perfectly natural in the larger construct. And that's that's just the way it is. And we go on step by step by step by step. That's the way we evolve. And the truth is in the experimental data. This is larger than Copernicus. I mean, this is huge. Yep. Yes, I think this will be a revolution at least of the scale of the Copernican revolution. This I think it'll huge. be larger because bringing consciousness into it for human evolution, this is really important. And, and, and let's be very fair. It, it is good that back in the Descartes time, they probably, that they split this business uh, between the physical materials and the mind uh, spiritual stuff uh, and, and made the assumption that no human qualities of conscious, consciousness can significantly influence sure. a well-designed target experiment in physical reality. Well, that may have, that was important then because in order to learn how to do science, imagine trying to develop the laws of science if the human mental capacities were sufficiently strong that they were influencing the experiment all the time. Mm. You'd never be able to develop the beginning laws. Now that we've done that and we know how to do that, we know how to do science, we know what's required to do science, now we have the tough job of doing the next level of science where we are part of the experiment. Mm -hmm. You can't separate the experimenter from the experiment and the device that you work with all the time, it gets entrained by you. And information entanglement between you and it and it and you create a hybrid. Sure. You, you become, you create other aspects of the other qualities that are able to extract information from the universe. It's just as if you had a really top-notch sensitive or psychic working beside you who could just keep telling you, 
oh, this is, this is what I see, etc. Sure, sure, absolutely. So, yeah, we have all that, we have that capacity always. And so we, this, what this says is the placebo effect, the double blind experiment is going to be gone like the dodo. Mm -hmm. Because we're always, we're going to be interacting more and more with everyone and everything as we evolve. As we are currently and just really are not uh, able to comprehend it, I, I believe. Right. No, it is a comprehension thing. And, and the new book that I've just finished um, is basically designed to reach the bright freshman in college. Mm. Uh, with this, a book with, well, there was one equation repeated a number of times. Basically, that's mm. it. So, <clears throat> um, I think that will help the general public um, we'll be able to grab a hold of that. And, and, but you know, you have to practice it. It's just like when you have young children and you want them to learn, you have them play with triangular blocks and cubic blocks and circular blocks. Sure. And they manipulate them, and in so doing, <coughs> they grow their brain and they learn about how these things go together. Absolutely. And and we have to do that likewise with this next level. And And from the mathematics that I've developed, it's possible to calculate. Uh, things about that next level. Now, we don't know, have all the information, but we at least can see what the patterns are and how the patterns form and how they connect. And so that's the next book I write will be basically that mathematical foundation. Well, one of the, I want to open up the lines for a question and a comment, but I have a, a couple more questions before I do. Uh, okay. One question uh, before I ask the, the uh, second and last, and that is, how can people get in contact with you? What is your information? Uh, so that people can uh, uh, get your books and get your information. It's well, the, the best place to go is to my uh, website, uh, www.tiller.org. And there they'll see sort of a lot of what we've been doing, and they'll see the books, um, how to order them. The, for within the U.S., I can give you the our order fulfillment house, and they promise to ship within 24 hours. Oh, that's awesome. So in the U.S., the number toll-free is 888-281-5170. Let me repeat it. 888-281-5170. And if they're calling internationally, they have to call 620-229-8800. Six two zero two two nine eight nine seven nine. So that there are the three books there now, um, and uh, if they buy them from there, uh, I make a bigger profit. Uh, I make a profit. Whereas as if they go to Amazon.com, where they could get them also, um, I don't make much because Amazon.com takes a large percentage of the. Well, we want to go. We want you to make the profit because we want to have you to have money to do more research on this and to bring this. Great. <laughs> Bring this to manifestation problem. into the world and to continue your research. Yeah, thank you. Now, uh, earlier, and I, I, I hope I wrote it down correctly, but you had mentioned that uh, there were basically three, three um, levels of, I, I believe, just human ascension. You said the adept, uh, the master, and the avatar. Was that correct? Yes, that was correct. Uh, can you give uh, some properties uh, of what uh, these three... Uh, aspects okay. of human evolution would look well, like? Let, let me talk about the avatar um, because we know uh, of, of those. Um, you can go back uh, Krishna, mm -hmm. Moses, um, Lutzal, um, Confucius, um, Buddha, Jesus, Mohammed, and probably lots and lots we don't know about. And so these were the individuals whose intention had been developed sufficiently, and their inner the structure at the inner domains of self were developed to a capacity that they could handle very broadband information at very, very high power densities, so that, that they could manifest things instantly. I mean, when I said that, that at the level of mind, for example, the the entropic thermodynamic energy change, change comparable to, to energy, um, compared to a bit of information, it's probably uh, 10 to the 
60, 70th or 80th power compared to one bit of information at the electric atom molecule level mm. of reality. So that as you evolve, you're evolving, you're evolving these muscles, if you like. I mean, it's just a, a metaphorical word. Um, these mu internal muscles at these different levels of self, which allow your instrument to have this great capacity to to deal and, and manipulate things at that level, to modulate the energies. And so what, at, at the fundamental level, I'm saying that it isn't just energy. There is energy consciousness. It's like it's a coupled unit. And so that everywhere in nature there is consciousness mm -hmm. that can be activated mm -hmm. to cause things to change. Mm -hmm. But you have to develop yourself. Ultimately, the human is the greatest instrument. We have to use training wheels in order to help develop ourselves to a stage where we don't need the training wheels and we keep going mm -hmm. on our own. And and then life will keep testing us. I mean, all of these these uh, great avatars were tested. Absolutely, absolutely. So so we understand the properties of, of the avatar. What would be the right. properties of the master and the adept? Well, the master, the, the one, the master is the one who, who, who knows. Um, <clears throat> the, the common ones that people will meet, I mean, there are individuals who, who are our masters. Mm -hmm. um, but the ones known mostly are Qigong masters, those who go beyond the meditational techniques and really practice moving qi. And those, of course, started first, for some of them, with the control of self in the martial arts mm -hmm. and the manifestation of energies and doing these amazing things that we see in videos um, that individuals can do. And masters, uh, Qigong masters, for example, can influence experiments from a thousand miles away. Yes. And so there, and there is experimental data uh, supporting that. Uh, not that it's accepted by the uh, traditional science community, but sure. nonetheless, it's there, and and there's a lot of that kind of thing around. And an adept, an adept, is one who's who's on the path, who who is making the internal transformation, and they are quieting themselves. They're becoming more inner self-managed. They're becoming more able to control their emotions. To to stay productive, to be supportive of those around them, to see your people around them as themselves, and they support them. When you build another, you build yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. th these are, this is the way it goes, and, and there are various gradations of adulthood and various gradations sure. of mastership, sure. and I suspect various gradations of avatar, but there's, avatars are so far beyond most of us. Yes. I, I would say uh, Sai Baba is certainly a master, uh, whether he's an avatar or not, I don't. I don't really know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But th this is is a, is a picture clear. It's like a scale. Sure. Okay, and I've just put three demarcation l lines on this this scale sure. of, of manifesting uh, <coughs> consciousness ability. What would you call someone who is not even an adept? What would you call that level of humanity? Uh, just normal folks. Just normal folks. Okay. <laughs> well, with that, let me unmute these lines here. Hold on a moment. All callers are muted. All callers are unmuted. And we're here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Press 6 to unmute your lines uh, so that you can come on this call and ask Dr. Tiller uh, a question or if you have a comment to pose. Um, Mind-boggling, blowing uh, work. Uh, I'm so honored to have been able to bring uh, Dr. Tiller uh, to this and, and for this work to be, you know, empirical. Uh, so if you have a question and a comment, please come out and uh, say where you're from and give your name. We might have scared everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that. A academia does that. Too. Yeah, I know, I know. This is heavy stuff, and I think everybody's mind is going, <laughs> raw, raw, raw. Dr. Dr. Tiller, thank you very much. This is Lynn Montgomery. I'm, a, I'm from Philadelphia. Okay. Hi, Lynn. And I really appreciate the uh, conversation. And certainly, um, I've been interested in this, the, the, you know, the scientific arena since I read The Conscious Universe. Yeah. Which I think was really a great piece of data. Yeah. And, um, so, I mean, I, and I'm interested in this because, you know, historically, I mean, I had, you know, I, 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 I just know people who've been able to, you know, to manipulate chi and do those right. kind of things. So. Right. And we all, and we all will down the path. 
and we all will. And, and you know, the, my, you know, the, the particular I, I, I'm in the pathway to become a student with Andrew Cohen, so I'm, I'm kind okay. of in a different. He's a, he's a fine man. Different realm of you know it, uh, the exploration of uh, consciousness and, and evolution of consciousness is itself right now. But I, but I, I do I am interested in manifestation. Yes. And and how to, and how to and, and what this whole thing means. So I, I appreciate the models that you have. I realize they're just work models, and it, but but they're they're you know it's just I really appreciate the contribution that you've made. Um, I, I do you have any suggestions as to where to you know who to, to where where the best sources for practicing qigong are? Or? I, I don't really have that detail, but you, you don't have to look very hard. And the, and the issue is. In all of these things is self-experiment. You know, you just gotta, you gotta try, and you gotta find out what is works for you right now. <clears throat> and different folks, different uh, pathways work for them. Some people love music when they meditate. Some don't. Uh, I mean, I do meditate. I mean, I do meditate. I do a non-dual kind of thing. Uh, yeah. What? What? I, and also, this is completely unrelated to that. Uh, since we, you know, several of us were missed the first part of the call because we were on the wrong number. Is it possible for us to get a, like a DVD of this, or? Oh, you're going to get the MP3 automatically. Well, yeah, I don't actually have an MP3 player. Well, you have a com you don't need an MP3 player to play it on your computer. Okay, great. Yeah, and matter of fact, you'll be able to make your own press your own CD as well. Okay, great. Yeah, and you didn't miss much. We were just uh, the uh, first question I asked Dr. Tillett was, "What is consciousness?" And so when you came on, he was still in the in the throes of that. Well, yeah, but I, I still would kind of be interested in that one, too. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and, and I thank you, Landon. We'll do something special for you and those who, who uh, made it on uh, uh, late. We'll do something special and give you some comps to some other uh, courses that are coming up, and I do apologize for that. Uh, well, no, I, I appreciate there's this thing that. called I human mean, error. Very fascinating. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much. You're very, very welcome. Great question. You know, uh, Dr. Tiller, it's interesting. When you were talking about Qigong, uh, I remember practicing and studying Bak Wa Chung, an internal form of martial arts, for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, our, our, my Sifu brought in a guy named Richard Chen from China and taught us Soaring Crane Qigong. Okay. And it was fascinating because I, this was, you know, it was completely new to me. I was, you know, uh, in the throes of my youth. And, and uh, I remember uh, the feeling, literally, this power of Qi because I was so mystified by it. Oh, the power of chi! What is this thing? You know, this prana, this right. this energy. And uh, uh, I, I had asked. I, I remember asking uh, uh, Master Chen, uh, "Could you uh, give me a demonstration of what chi feels like?" And he basically just put his hands on my sh his, uh, his hand on my shoulder, right. and I felt this surge of heat and energy, and I ended up going across the entire room. And he had yeah. hardly flinched. Yep. And yep. you know, if you don't. If you, if, if you have not gone through that yourself and just heard it, you know, you would just kind of say, okay, well, that's just urban legend. Right, but, you know, when you have, when you have validating experience, yes. it, it, really, uh, it re really connects to you inside. Uh, I mean, I remember the same sorts of things, but I remember meeting uh, various uh, really competent, really competent channels who would give me information about future life and so on. Mm -hmm. And in two of them in particular, uh, over, over a span of 50 years, everything they've said, they've said has been correct, and none of it was wrong. That's just correct. Yeah, but they're, they're, they're rare. Okay? Yeah. And, um, but, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's possible. If one can do it, everyone can do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that's, that's what one has to realize, that it the, needs to be heard. the issue is the data, seeing the data is important, yes. and, and one has to be careful about the interpretation. To, that, that takes some doing, and you have to go at it very carefully, because this is a terribly complex business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Questions and comments for Dr. Question. William Tiller. Hello? Yes. Hello. Hi, this is Narendra from Erie, Pennsylvania. Yes, Narendra. Uh, uh, doctor, um, you had mentioned about placebo effect. Yes. And placebo effects are usually about 15 to 20 percent for the patient person. I was wondering why there is, why is there any, does he have any comment on and why it is only on 15, 20 percent? Well, the but issue, the, let, let's talk to that. There was a, 
it's a good it's a good question. It's an important one because it opens up something I think is really important for us to be aware of. Um, about three or four years ago, there was an article by the on the placebo effect in Science Magazine by a man by the name of Ensering, and I talk about it I think uh, on one or two pages in the first chapter of Conscious Acts of Creation, and he was uh, describing the situation relative to. Uh, it was a double-blind experiment. Um, it may come to me. It was relative to uh, uh, the effect of a particular drug on consciousness. Uh, th but the point he was making was, of course, at that point in time, the placebo effect was 75 to 80 percent, and many medical trials failed because of the placebo effect. Whereas 15, 20 years earlier, the same kind of experiment was done and the placebo effect was about 15%. So the question that I ask, and I'm sure many others must have asked, is what happened in the ensuing 20 to 25 years to have the placebo effect increase so remarkably? Um, and two pieces to the answer. One is I addressed this question in a scientific paper in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine, which came came out. It was a December issue of last year, um, and I talked in great detail about how that comes about. But the the issue here is that I think something has been going on cosmically in the universe to lift the concentration of these deltrons that I talk about. Because, and what that would do is that that produces coupling. And when it, when the coupling increases, then the difference between a treatment and a placebo goes to zero. Because you can show mathematically that at this second level of physical reality, the, the components of equality are all vectors. And so you have to you have to work out the resulting vector, which is the sum of let's say three vectors. Let's take an experiment with a medical doctor, a treatment, and a placebo. Okay, in a double-blind experiment. So we're just saying there's three components in the reciprocal space. They're all connected, and and so you've got a sum of three vectors. But you don't you don't measure the amplitude of the pattern in reciprocal. Space. You want to get that to modulus itself. And so what you have to do is you have to multiply that summation vector with its complex conjugate, which which means it's what you get then when if you do that kind of comp that math that mathematics, you get the sum of the squares of each of those three things, and that's all you would have if they were not coupled together, if they were not connected in any way. But they are connected always because humans are always pumping these deltrons out of themselves to some degree. And because they're connected then, what you see is you not only get the sum of the squares, but you get two times the sum of all the cross products. So you see that in the mathematics that there is a product of a treatment times a placebo effect. And there's a, there's a product of the doctor times the placebo effect. And these, what this says then, is that the placebo effect and the treatment effect cannot be uncoupled. They are there. And if, as if this coupling it becomes strong enough, then the placebo becomes the treatment but by information entanglement with mm. the treatment. So you can't discriminate one from the other. I mean, that's what we showed in our experiments. When we uh, do the same kind of experiment in Italy, and do it in Payson. And in Payson, we have an IIED to imprint the space and lift the gauge symmetry state. If they're a connect, they appear to be, if they're connected in our experiment, then it isn't very long before they're getting exactly, or maybe not exactly, but getting results remarkably like ours. And I talk about that in the third book, uh, Some Science Adventures with Real Magic. The, the whole replication experiment is shown there and the consequences. And, and so, in essence, it's possible to work out 
ultimately the mathematics of how this entanglement <coughs> microscopically works. And it's very different than quantum entanglement. Mm -hmm. Quantum entanglement deals with only very, very small things at remarkably low temperatures, near mm -hmm. absolute zero. And I, in this case, we're talking about room temperature, <coughs> macroscopic entanglement. That is a room which is 10,000 cubic foot with a laboratory 6,000 miles away that's 1,000 cubic foot. So some very interesting new physics coming to light. Absolutely amazing. Uh, Dr. Clark, <coughs> I, I have to go. I just want to thank you again. Um, and I look forward to hear from you guys. Absolutely. Thank you, Lynn, so much. Make sure you send me a personal email so I, I'll know who you are and, and, and we'll connect. Okay, just the, the, the shock? Yeah, Philippe at shockinstitute.com. You got it, buddy. <coughs> Thank you so much again, Lynn. Bet. Questions and comments uh, for Dr. Tiller as we're winding down this evening? Uh, yes, this is Sharon Malhadra in Erie, Pennsylvania. And I have a, regard, uh, a question regarding this and its application to patients in a hospital. Is there anything uh, currently uh, being researched as far as caregivers' intent? Um, for example, um, I'm, I'm a registered nurse, and oftentimes I have seen other nurses read the patient's chart and depending on whatever illness the patient might be presenting, they have already formed an attitude in their mind, regardless of how caring or giving and, and delicate they are with the patient, yes. they've already formed this attitude that this is what is going to happen with this patient based on their past experience. With so if you... experience is just conventional physics. Conventional. <laughs> Right. So is there anywhere where this is being, uh, where a small group of health professionals are um, engaged in an experiment to imprint their intent or even, uh, not even the imprinting, but simply being in the environment caring for a set of patients with uh, health care professionals who are, of course, um, knowledgeable of raising the the energy the consciousness and the meditation etc and using their intent that this patient is is healthy or my intent can make it be so is well, the, there anything the in the future uh, oh okay if we talk about the present versus the future there will be lots and lots of evidence well yeah in the okay <laughs> Uh, we're talking we about talk? potential, or uh, yeah. is there anything occurring okay. in the now? The, the, um, things, the, the things that I see occurring in the now, people are doing work of this nature in, on cells, uh, osteoblasts, um, they're doing them on rats, um, having great success with many of these mm -hmm. kinds of things in terms, and now when you get up to a whole human, I mean, I've tried some experiments, and it's been, they've been helpful, but not <clears throat> not total, you know, when people call me and such and they have problems, it's usually they're, they've got Parkinson's disease or they've got leukemia, and you're really talking about a tough, tough uh, hurdle to go over. And I don't think, I don't know that we're ready for that yet, but I am uh, experimenting with a new kind of device whose uh, power in reciprocal space will be a thousand to a million times that which I used in the Minnesota experiments, which were written on about in conscious acts of creation. So, and we've got now the detector which would let us see where things are going, at least to some degree. And so I think there will be lots of experiments on this regard. At the moment, it's, it's uh, I just happened to, to see something someone sent me on the use of therapeutic touch relative to osteoblasts. And I know, for example, we've done we did an experiment that became a thesis for a woman at Holos University, and it had to do with an experiment at a distance of, of using our techniques to broadcast um, an intention, a healing intention for depression and anxiety. Uh, in fact, it was a, a medical doctor from Pennsylvania, uh, his pool of 250 patients, and, and, uh, and some outliers, one from Alberta and one from Mexico, and the, the uh, IIED transmitting device 
was in Missouri and the uh, um, the control site was in uh, Idaho. So, and in eight months, the uh, statistical results uh, were that there was significant benefit for um, depression and anxiety uh, with p-values better than 0 0.001. So that's, that's about what I know. I'm sure there's a lot in the works, but um, it's a slow process to, to get this kind of thing done. And the issue is, just as I tell, told the gentleman mm -hmm. previously, um, if the attitude of mind is that this patient is going to go this way, as many doctors would tell people, well, you, I'm sorry, you clean up your affairs, you've only got two months, um, etc. cetera. If, if that attitude of mind is held, mm -hmm. then there's a coupling coefficient between the doctor's attitude of mind and the treatment, and that's going to influence the outcomes. Mm -hmm. Now, one experiment of that nature, um, let's see, the Benson up in Harvard did uh, an experiment with some doctors using some far out kind of devices that would be in the alternative medicine camp. And the first time he did these experiments with patients, or they did, um, they got something like a 70 to 80 percent uh, benefit from these experiments. And then they were sitting around trying to looking, talking about these, and they couldn't figure out how possibly they could have gotten such good results. Yeah. And, and it just couldn't possibly have happened. Well, the next time they repeated the experiment, they got 30%. Uh-huh. <laughs> so so you, begin to see, you begin to see these interactions uh, because we're all connected. Yeah. You see, it's a, de it's a degree of connection that's in question. That's incredible. That really helps in terms of uh, how intentions are manifested. And what yeah, so so what you hold in your mind is really important. Yes. For everybody. Yes. Fascinating. Excellent question, Sharon. Thank you for bringing that uh, out. Questions and comments for Dr. Tiller as we're uh, closing down tonight. Going once, going twice. Dr. Tiller, thank you so very much. Uh, you know what? we got to bring you back because it's not enough time. It's so, it's so much information. There is so much information. I can't <laughs> wait. So uh, I'm just going to make the commitment and put you on the spot and say, hey, can you come back? And we we'll do, do this again, again and do yep. another extension. I'm happy to push the envelope. Fantastic. And everybody here who's on the call, you guys will be comped and get free access to it. So thank you so much, Dr. Tiller, for uh, uh, talking with me tonight about conscious acts of creation and this process of, of uh, really, truly manifesting our reality. And uh, we're going to take it to the next level uh, in a uh, subsequent call that we're going to have uh, perhaps in the next uh, 30 to 60 days, okay? Sounds good. It is our future. All right, my friend. Before you go, give that web address again. The website is www.tiller.org. Fantastic. And when is, new book, when is this new book due out? Well, um, I am deciding whether to go with a publisher uh, or whether to self-publish, as I did my earlier books. Okay. If I go with a publisher, it will take quite a while. Yeah. If I go to myself, it will be out in three months. Well, you know which one I'm going to push for. Yes. yes. <laughs> I, I want it to be out in three months. Too. I, I'm already setting my intentions. We're already, <laughs> we're already, I'm already coupling over here. Okay. All right. <laughs> so... God bless you. I'll talk to you soon. Good night, everybody. Thanks, thanks Good night. so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Thank everyone. you. Thanks. Bye now. Aloha. We are with the Professor Meritas, Dr. William Tiller from Stanford University. Welcome and aloha. Aloha to you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Pleasure to have you in this state. Good. You have been very famous from your knowledge and research on intuition and intention. I would say that's probably true, but there was a time when I was famous for my orthodox science. <laughs> what is the difference? Can you explain the journey? The, and the difference. The difference is that orthodox science has a hangover from the days of Descartes. That is that no human qualities of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, or spirit can significantly influence a well-designed target experiment in physical reality. And that may have been true in the days of Descartes, 
but it is no longer true. Our experiments show that that is very, very wrong. It says that our science is very limited. It, it is able to do some use, some interesting things, and but it's missing the point relative to humans. Right. So this weekend, you will be giving a workshop. I will be giving basically a workshop, uh, th certainly Thursday night, at Spalding Auditorium. Between what will that be about? That will be the same general topic, but trimmed down. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I'll be talking with Q&A um, for two and a half hours on this general topic, showing how our orthodox science community uh, went astray mm -hmm. and what is needed to get it back on track, how to change the paradigm to one that is more human-oriented, uh, more consciousness-oriented, and more hopeful and for when the will world. Be the, oriented. Weekend? the weekend will now expand mm -hmm. that picture to give chapter and verse. Much, much data, lots of explanations, how we're on the threshold <coughs> of opening a door to a new universe of understanding. And it will be a lot of fun for orthodox science when they open their eyes and expand their wings into the new area. And, and will there be like some kind of exercises or practical application? The practical application is we have shown that all humans have their acupuncture meridian system at what's called a couple level of reality. The couple level of reality, there's two levels of physical reality which normally do not interact with each other. But using intention, it's possible to bring about that interaction. And it is the new level, which functions in the physical vacuum, that is influenced by intention. And thus it only enters measurement reality so in real so life. Can you help us understand and yes. practically use our yes. intentions? Yes. Because I have noticed in my yep. work as yep. emotional freedom coach, I noticed with people that they really want to learn yes. how to use the secret yes. to manifest things, to grow. I think of the secret, by the way, as preschool. Of course. Yeah. But it was very important yes. For, yes. for masses, the, it the was. move yeah. people yes. towards. I was surprised at how many people were there. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and so will this workshop that you will give us, will this help us in our life in some way that we can move if, to if the next step or learn the, the people, how to touch yeah. intuition? People, people already have the infrastructure in themselves. They just need to practice, practice, practice. And they can change themselves from a normal individual to an adept, from an adept to a master, and from a master to an avatar. Is that All of us can do. For it. Everyone? Yes, but maybe not in just one lifetime. I will certainly put it in front of them, in in very rich ways. Um, it's there for everybody. We all can do it. We have to care enough. We have to give it meaning. We have to be disciplined, and we have to practice. The we have been able to. We build a device to measure the change in the energy state of the room when one of these conditioned host, intention host devices is operating in the room. And ultimately, we want to turn that into a biofeedback device. So excuse now, me, what is intention host device? It is what we do is with the intention, we imprint it into a little electronic Box. Will you bring it to the workshop? Uh, I will show it. I didn't bring it. I'll tell people where they can buy one. Um, but they have to imprint it themselves. The uh, um, And I'll show all the data. I mean, it's how we do it. How, how we imprint these things. Mm -hmm. How uh, we put them to work. So there are many ways to do it. We have found a pathway which is very straightforward. Um, good science, um, if one pays attention. And uh, as I say, from our measurements, everybody has the capability. And this is the pathway for our evolution over the next, we'll call it epochs of our evolutionary process. 
um, because you soon get out of this space-time domain and into domains that are not temporal. And so you can't quite use time. But if you were to count it in time, it, maybe you'd be talking about the next several million years of your existence. You will change a great deal. Which is nothing. Which is nothing. From another perspective. It, from another perspective, yes. exactly. And, and will you be able to explain, maybe scientifically to people, how come that Reiki works? How come that no. tapping works? We, we can, what if, is the science behind it? If people ask the questions, I have, I will be talking about some of the healing work from the reconnection healing, the Eric Pearl work, because I've done measurements uh, on that and have very good data, very important. Uh, so it relates to all healing aspects. So um, I'm willing to respond to any question the audience wishes to ask, so if, if I can. Anybody, if anybody has a question, related to your personal growth, related to techniques you are using, yeah. come to this workshop on Thursday, Saturday, Saturday and, and Sunday, Sunday yes. all in UH. Personally, if I can ask you the question, how come EFT works? What is your research behind tapping? Why tapping works? Well, it's complex, but the issue is that tapping is producing a stimulus like succussion in uh, homeopathy. And you're tapping acupuncture points. The acupuncture meridian system is the template upon which the electric body is built. So when you tap the acupuncture point, you're going to the source of physical events in life, mm -hmm. of the body. So. Um, Once you start, and the, and the important point is that that level of reality is already at the coupled state of reality. And I'll explain what that means in the, um, not, not right here. I have in, to use in diagrams. The, in the workshop. In the workshop. More time. But, yes. but basically, when you are tapping, you have an intention to make a change, mm -hmm. and you are touching the source. Yeah, let's say for the headache. Right. Mm -hmm. You're touching the source. And so your intention becomes very strong because you're putting it into the acupuncture meridian system. And therefore, the intent, because that's the level upon which intention works in our devices. And therefore, it gets yeah. to Gary the body. Craig, Gary Craig said once, he said, it doesn't the tapping itself, yeah. it doesn't make much right. difference as the intention. And he said, you will see in a few years, yeah. Yeah. nobody will tap anymore. No, you don't need to. Because we will tap into inside. Exactly. You, you can hold, that's the whole point, is to hold the intention in your mind. Ultimately, we humans are the device. Everything gets built into us. We don't need training wheels. We have the capability, and when we build it into ourselves, build the infrastructure, etc. And when you build infrastructure into the body, more spirit enters. Hello, Professor Tiller. Hello and good afternoon. <laughs> I'm in Hawaii. Where, where are you right now? Now I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona. Ah, oh, love Scottsdale. Beautiful place. Yes, well, we were in Maui also uh, last week. We got back on the 19th. Uh-huh. And what so is the background behind you? Because you're in front of a that painting. Aren't we're, you? In, we're in a chapel. Um, this is a spiritual center and church, and that's um, the front frontispiece of the chapel. Ah, beautiful. So yeah. um, we had a conversation a long time ago, but it wasn't through video. It was uh, on the phone, and I'm very happy today this is on, on camera. Okay. This is wonderful. Yeah, well, I'm glad too. <laughs> 
So I would love to, to speak about the psychoenergetic science because this yes. is your thing and I would love to learn more about it. Can you give us a bit of your background and how you came to this kind of science and what it is and yeah. how it can help us to, to bridge what we okay. feel inside but we haven't yet explained it scientifically on, on, on this end of normal, regular people. Right. Okay. Um, I was in industry for nine years at the Westinghouse Research Lab as an advisory physicist and then um, moved to being a full professor with tenure at Stanford uh, University in 1964 and uh, retired uh, from Stanford University in uh, 1998. My last PhD student was in 2000. Generally, uh, my teaching was graduate students uh, rather than undergraduate students, and I had research people. I probably graduated uh, 50 PhD students in that time period that I was there. So I'm a card-carrying orthodox scientist, and when I was on my first tour of duty as on sabbatical, I, although I started out as a garden variety professor, um, the man who brought me in uh, turned very ill and I was asked to take over as department chair, which I did um, until I decided to give that up in 1970. The going on sabbatical, I picked up this little book uh, called Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain um, by Ostrander and Schroeder. And I knew a great deal about the, that area because my wife and I became daily meditators in 1964. Uh, and we had lots of experiences with uh, psychic phenomena and people. Even though I was uh, uh, department chair, I was still interested in this other. And as I read this book on the plane to my sabbatical, or our sabbatical in Oxford, the thought kept coming into my mind. How might the universe be structured to allow this crazy seeming kind of stuff to naturally coexist with the orthodox science that I was doing every day with my graduate students? When I got to Oxford, um, I started to write the book I went there to write on my orthodox area, which was uh, science of crystallization. and. Uh, I kept having this same question come into my mind. It was very distracting, and after about three weeks, I decided I'm not going to do this book. I'm going to find out, if I can, how the universe might be constructed to allow this stuff to exist. And so my wife and I, with our daily meditation, which is usually about an hour long, we would go into meditation and I would hold the brick of the question, how might this universe be structured to allow this stuff to occur? And by the end of the day, end of the hour, usually I'd have some insight and she would have some insight and we'd talk a bit because uh, her insight, although she was not in any way scientific, was always very fruitful. Females are better at psychic stuff than males. and. Um, then I'd work all day up, upstairs in the house we had um, trying to decide what experimental data was this insight violating. And by the end of the day, I would have another set of questions. And so the next day we'd go into meditation. I'd hold the primary uh, intention our question, and then I would hold these other questions, just like a brick, like a supplicant, asking the universe for help in understanding. And uh, this went on every day. I did it for six months. We did it every day. By the end of the six months, I had a model that allowed the two to naturally coexist. But one of the key issues that of enlightenment that came was, you must get outside of distance time to understand how these two things can naturally coexist. Well, by that time, I was really impressed with how important this area of work mankind. 
much more important than I thought my normal science was at Stanford. And so I thought, who might I get to commit to working on this, seriously working on it? And I finally decided I couldn't figure out who could do it and, there, and that it had to be me. Well, that was tough. I needed my day job to feed my family. So I decided to give up being department chair to have time. I decided to give up my government committees to have time. I decided to give up my professional committees to have time. And with that block of time, I divided it into three parts. Continued experiential development of self. Second third was to keep looking at the universe to see how what the structure looked like and ultimately mathematically what it might look like. And then the third was to do experiments to keep the theory honest. And so I developed um, an inside the university life of conventional science and an outside the university life of psychoenergetic science. And I, so that was in 1970, and I have been doing that ever since. Uh, the universe was, university was not happy with it, but I was a tenured professor, professor fortunately, and therefore so long as I did my day job well, uh, I was still uh, allowed to be a full professor with tenure. So well, that was good. But it's a lonely life in a sense because there's a natural separation mm -hmm. um, when you are walking a different path than the pack. Now, I walk the path of orthodox science quite well um, in my daily work, but I had this other, and I would have phone calls from people all around the world who, who thought they were going crazy or whose family thought they were going crazy. And I would describe to them the research work that was being done uh, to how to understand what they were going through, their internal transformation. And then in a half an hour later, I had to switch from that mode of reality to have be prepared for my lecture. So it was a stretch, but it was an interesting adventure. And uh, I wouldn't have changed a thing. Mm. And, and so you, how have you evolved since then? I mean, what, because really this, oh. this, this intention proved now to, to change, as you say on your site, and as you say in lecture, our physical reality. Yes. So how... Okay, what I, what I did first, um, I didn't get into the serious intention, although the first book I wrote was, um, which, which came out in 1997, it was called... Uh, Science and Human Transformation, uh, Subtle Energies, Intentionality, and Consciousness. So I continued that, gathering data in that area for, uh, well, 20 years. Uh, yeah, basically 20 years uh, until I received some funding serious funding uh, from a, a, a philanthropist and who is dead now. But um, so I was able to put together a team and the work that's best known is the intention work. There had been since the 1600s the assumption of Descartes that no human qualities of consciousness intention, emotion, mind, or spirit can significantly influence a well-designed target experiment in physical reality. Now, at the time, that was a very useful assumption because, of course, it was only a century away from having a theocratic society, and uh, Logos switched to science, distance time science, in the, after Copernicus and Galileo and then Newton. Um, but there was a, there's always a long hangover from one paradigm to another. And so he made this assumption in order that science, physics, natural <coughs> phenomena could be clearly separated from religion. So it was a useful uh, assumption at that time. But no one ever 
studied the assumption after that, except that it stuck with orthodox science and orthodox medicine. So unconsciously, this exists in these folks. And so I decided I will use this money to seriously test this assumption of Descartes. Um, so I designed with all of the procedures I use for my normal Stanford work, uh, four target experiments. And, and the first one was to increase the pH of water. That's the alkaline acidic balance of water uh, by one full pH unit. That's a factor of 10 of hydrogen ion concentration. <clears throat> it's a reduction in hydrogen ion concentration by a factor of 10. That's very large. In the human body, if you were doing this with the blood, if you increase the pH by a half a pH unit or reduce it by half a pH unit, you're dead on both ends. So, and we're seeing this kind of thing now with the CO2 concentration growing in the atmosphere, that that gets into the oceans and that is killing the uh, corals. Uh, and so it's, it's a big deal, a one pH unit. Uh, for biological systems, a tenth of a pH unit is, is a death knell for many of them. So it's important. Anyway, the second experiment was to take the same water, uh, and decrease the pH by one full pH unit, again with no chemical additions. The third experiment, I should say that we found a way to imprint an intention in a simple electrical device from a deep meditative state. And when we would do that, not only do we change the physical properties of things, we change the physical reality of the space. The space becomes conditioned in a very special way, like the great cathedrals of Europe, and more than that. So the third thing was to condition a space, and the experiment was to take a specific liver enzyme, alkaline phosphatase, and the intention was to significantly increase the chemical activity. That's a little more than chemical concentration, but it's something like that, the chemical activity. By a 30-minute exposure to the conditioned space, we measured the acti chemical activity before the experiment. We measured it after 30-minute exposure. So that was the third experiment. The fourth experiment was to take a living system, and this was fruit fly larva, and the intention here was to increase the energy storage molecule relative to its chemical precursor. That's, that's, that's ATP to ADP. That is to increase from two phosphorus atoms in the molecule to three phosphorus atoms in the molecule. And that would make the fruit fly larva more physically fit and therefore shorten the larval development time to the adult fly stage. That was our assumption. Okay, so that was the fourth experiment. All the experiments were robustly successful. And the two biological ones, the, they were successful to the point of a p-value better than 0 0.001. That is less than one chance in a thousand that this could have occurred by a random chance. Those were the four target experiments. They were so successful and that unequivocally proved that the basic assumption of Descartes no longer holds in t today's world. However, how to get the orthodox science community or medical community to look at the experimental data? It's basically the same way it was with Galileo back in his time. The theocrats were not willing to look at his, through his telescope at his experimental data. Same thing today. It's unfortunate. It'll happen. It will change because the data is mounting more and more and more. Um, the general public love it because they see hope that isn't there in the orthodox science or orthodox medicine, which are both very materialistic. Yeah, and we feel it as non-scientific people. We feel it yes. in our heart. We know it. Absolutely. And, and we, we don't have, we cannot prove it. And, and there is the separation between the people can feel that there's so much more and that we're all 
united. We're all linked through this huge field of and, consciousness. And, and it, turns, it turns out the, the more the space is conditioned, the more these experiments go, the greater is the connectivity. We found that there is another level of physical reality. It's in the coarsest level of the physical vacuum. Physical vacuum is where all of this stuff is. It's where all of the higher qualities of humans are. Quantum mechanics, for example, is a distance time second order differential equation, which means it can deal with the meat of humans, but it can't deal with those special qualities, emotions, mind, spirit. We need to expand the reference frame we're using to study nature. And the Orthodox community, they've known about this category of phenomena, of psychic phenomena for one to two centuries. But they, since it doesn't satisfy their internal self-consistency requirements of Orthodox science, they either have to change their attitudes and their way of doing experiments, or they have to sweep it under the rug. Unfortunately, they've chosen to sweep it under the rug. Yeah, because, and that's been going on for a long time. Because the way it's set up, from my understanding, it's impossible to move forward in the science. The science can evolve too, but it's not possible through its, methodo its current methodology. So how, how do you see all of this opening up? It's just a matter well, of... Well, they, 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 they have to... They're stuck. They're <clears throat> terribly stuck. And they're, they're doing a good job with materialistic science. But as far as humans are concerned, they are not doing anything. And with what is there, they are not going to be able to do anything. They have to go to another level of reality. They have to get out of the box. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're kind of afraid, to get, I think, to get out of the box. It changes everything. Universities are the same. Universities won't allow this stuff to be taught to get a PhD degree in this. Now, it's understandable. There aren't jobs for such people. So it'll be a while before we have converted, and, and my work is starting to move in that direction, is to try to show that you can have a business and make profit and create new things using these procedures. But in general, people have to build themselves, and the people have to they pay for all the research that goes on in universities. Uh, and therefore, they eventually can demand what kind of material they want to be taught. And when that happens, then governments and universities will begin to open that door. In the meantime, I'm trying to open that door with doing hard research that expands this consciousness, expands, shows the data we have learned also how to broadcast this and broadcast intention over 6,000 miles. We've, we've done experiments, most, one of the most recent ones, to a particular room in a particular building on a particular corner of Berlin, Germany. Um, they had the same kind of equipment that we had there, but we imprinted the device they had an unimprinted device, and we broadcast using a subtle energy from Payson, Arizona. It's up in the mountains, uh, about 80 miles from here. And uh, it was remarkably successful. So that means now that we can broadcast um, and change the intention. Um, we did an experiment to heal hundreds of people with depression and anxiety, um, separated by thousands of square miles, just by their name and address being continuously scrolled through a computer in the room where there was an intention host device. The control system had everything the same, except it wasn't an intention imprinted device. Nothing happened. So instead and of I, being human beings, thinking that same thought and holding that same intention, you're saying you're able to reproduce it through those computers that are sending those... Yes. Those yes. If, if people you have to understand, people have to hold the same intention, but they have to be coherent. Most people are not very coherent, and they may think they're holding the intention, 
Okay. You meet with That's the heart, I... heart coherence. Uh, it's a heart connection, yes, but can you do it reproducibly in a quantitative way every day? That's the issue. We. That's why I chose to use a simple electronic device, a device in which I can imprint an intention. And I found the very first time I did that, I took the, in, in, the device, which I call an intention host device, that had been imprinted, and I separated it by about 100 meters from an unimprinted device, identical, physically identical, but unimprinted, and turn them both off electrically. So there should be no change, because there's no electrical information signal. But within three to five days, the unimprinted device picked up the imprint, which says that there's another level of nature that we access with our device, and that, and that can broadcast it seems to be unlimited, but I don't know that. I only know 6,000 miles is as far as I've tried to go. But my intuition is that we can broadcast simultaneously to thousands of people, millions of people anywhere in the world. At the moment, we're working with hundreds. Um, one of the things that we are setting in motion is to broadcast to children diagnosed as autistic and a different intention to their parents. The children appear to have this difficulty because they're advanced souls who have a need for greater infrastructure in their bio body suits. Bio body suit is what we're wearing. So that's like a diving bell. Needs instrumentation so you can experience the environment. These souls need something more advanced than that, because I think they're forerunners of what is coming for all of us. That is, we've sort of finished the, not quite finished, but we're wrapping up the epoch that we're in. And I think the Higgs boson experiments um, sort of wrap up that conventional reality, which is everything goes slower in the velocity of light. Now we go to the vacuum and everything goes faster than light. And so we do not have conventional instruments to access that information. We have some when we're working on others so that we can access those levels of the physical vacuum. So I think of a, I call it the ladder of understanding that we have worked on for, 600, for 400 years on the lowest rung of the ladder and built it very well. But now we need to stretch a little further, and that's what our work is doing. Psychoenergetic science works on the second rung of the ladder. And so we, we're hanging on by our fingertips, we're making some progress, and it will change our reality. Mm. I, was, so. I, was, I was interviewing uh, somebody recently, a few months ago in Geneva, that works very closely to autistic, autistic uh, kids, and he was saying that they it's very easy for them to go out of their body and they experience a lot more things. Actually, but it's hard, it's hard for them to get back into their body. Yeah. That's, that's the problem. And so that's what my intention statement will be working on. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. what, do we, what can we expect in the, in the, in the, in the, the future as to how human beings, uh, what we're developing and what we can really start to work on to be able to, to be in these fast times and okay. these changes? Let, let, me, let me tell you what my fundamental working hypothesis is. I think we are all spirits having a physical experience as we ride the river of life together. Our spiritual parents dressed us in these bio body suits and put us in this playpen, which we call a universe, in order to grow in coherence, in order to develop our gifts of intentionality, and in order to become what we were intended to become, which is co-creators with our spiritual parents. When I say co-creators, I mean big time stuff. But that's the way down the road. We are just babes crawling across the floor of the universe at the moment. And we have a long way to grow. A long, long way to grow. And the general public is starting to really work on it. And that's wonderful. And because they are, the Orthodox community will change with the data, the data that we provide eventually. 
eventually they will not be able to withstand the general public. So we are, let me give you a couple of examples. Yeah. Take it, let's take a 60 watt light bulb. Okay, it gives a bit of light, not a lot of light. And the reason it doesn't give a lot of light is because the photons that come out of the light bulb interfere with each other. You get destruct, what's called destructive interference. However, if you could influence those photons so that they became coherent with each other, so that they come out riding on each other's back, then the energy density at the surface of the light bulb would be close to a hundred times the surface of the sun. We are like that light bulb, quite incoherent, mostly asleep, but we can be that coherent source, and that's part of where we're going. Let me give another example. Um, a great physicist, um, Wheeler, John Wheeler, passed on now. Uh, astrophysicist, really great. He calculated that for quantum mechanics and relativity theory to be internally self-consistent, the vacuum, the physical vacuum, had to contain an energy density of something like 10 to the power 94 grams equivalent of electromagnetic energy per cubic centimeter. Well, that's a big number. What does it mean? From astronomers, we can get an average density of electromagnetic matter in the cosmos. Cosmos is a sphere of about 15 billion light years radius. So you multiply the average energy density, mass density of electromagnetic energy times that volume, and you get a number, a very big number. Now let's take the Wheeler calculation. We take that number and we multiply it by the volume, the physical volume of a single hydrogen atom. That's like one over one followed by 22 zeros. When you multiply those two together, you get another number. And that number is a trillion times the other number. That is, it's a trillion times more latent energy than all of the electromagnetic mass in all of the stars and all of the planets and all of the cosmic dust in our entire cosmos. That is our future. That, in fact, is the coarsest level of that is what we are addressing. We are able to meaningfully touch that aspect of physical reality where things are starting to go faster than light. That's our future. That's how we're really going to go to the stars. That's how we're really going to help us become. And it is by learning to meditate or do Qigong as a, these are practices. These are practices that you do from deep within. The more you do, the more you become. And the more you become, everything changes and everything gets connected. There's more, there, well, for example, let's take the placebo effect in medicine. 30 years ago, it was practically zero, maybe 5%. In the last 30 years, it's become something like 95%. How can that be if a placebo is inert? Well, it turns out when you look at the connectivity that has been occurring because of these subtle energies, then, and in particular what I call the coupler, which lets us cause slower than light matter to interact with faster than light matter. When that kind of thing occurs, then it turns out you can't treat a placebo as inert because the mathematics shows you that a placebo, its functionability, its effect is multiplied by the doctor, the doctor's intention, it's multiplied by the treatment, it's multiplied by the patients. So that's why the placebo is getting close to the treatment result. It's because it's, it's a vector sum that is required. Mm. can't be treated as a mathematical scale. 
Um, so this is going to change everywhere. Controlled, double blind controls, forget it. It's not going to happen in the future because we are getting more connected. Everything is getting connected because this coupler is not just growing in our experiments, it's growing in the cosmos. That's what the placebo results are showing us. It's That coupler is growing in magnitude. Um, and we're on our way to some other great adventure. I love the word adventure because it also means stepping in this unknown. And we know that yes. once we step in this unknown, not just really not knowing, amazing yes. things happen. How did you yeah. how do you put that together in scientific terms? How did you what is your research showing? Why, why, oh, why is that so the, the research is the research is showing that all the action is not going on in distance time. And orthodox science is distance time only. As I said, a second order differential equation is what is the best that quantum mechanics, present day quantum mechanics can do. I mean, it's not completed. Relativity theory is not completed. Einstein's limitation of the velocity of light is shown, you can begin to show that that's not the end. Once you have another level of, of physical reality, I call it the fine physical reality versus the coarse physical reality. That means that as you increase the energy up towards going towards the velocity of light, you don't have to go all the way to the velocity of light. It'll just tunnel through into the faster than light domain, which also responds to relativity theory. And if relativity theory fits faster than light and slower than light, there's just trouble at the light barrier. And if you have only the one domain, well, you would just treat trying to go to the velocity of light, which takes more energy, takes an infinite amount of energy, so it's never going to happen. And that's why Einstein said what he said, that you can't go faster than light. But as soon as you show that nature has another level, or at least one other level of reality, and all I'm showing is the second rung of the ladder. But that's enough. You can tunnel through. So it means that if our physics community would open their mind to the possibilities and look at some of the data that exists, they can explain dark matter and dark energy. They can explain, they'll be able to explain why there's acceleration at the edge of the universe rather than deceleration, which is what is predicted by our normal physical reality. They say they don't understand what dark matter is, but all they have to do is to really go and look at uh, the de Broglie work of the 1920s and the uh, Dirac work of the 1920s, both who won Nobel Prizes. But they, he, he talked about and negative energies. See, they couldn't understand what a negative means. But if they think a little more, they'll find that they can. In fact, I've written about this. I should mention on my website, tiller.org, there are at the moment 26 free white papers, one of which deals with this Dirac work and shows how to understand, begin to understand negative energies. So, but again, it's this stuckness, you know, um, they're they're terribly committed to it, and uh, they're going to they will change eventually. But it it can be either slow or fast. It'll be faster if the general public put some pressure on them. You you were featured in in what the bleep that a lot yes. of us have seen. Have you done a lot of other documentaries or work? I have I have done. Uh, I have two DVDs that are on my website uh, that are accessible on terms of the psychoenergetic science. Uh, one is a seven-hour DVD, which was an entire weekend where I was the only speaker, and I talked about the early work. So it's available for sale, and there's PayPal, so people can purchase it if they wish. There are four books now in, in that area, and there are the 26 free white, 27 free white papers. By next week, there'll be 28. Um, what is that one about? Uh, that one is this broadcast to Germany, the 28th. The, the 27th is uh, towards a union of logos and mythos. 
Both were re rejected by orthodox science journals. Um, they don't get it. They don't want to get it. Um, so I put them up on my website. So they're free for anybody to access and print out for themselves or their friends or whatever. So this is all going forward and we're gathering more data every day. We don't have funds, but fortunately the two people that work with me, they're longtime city yoga practitioners and they're at the moment have been willing to work for nothing. So it's still have been challenges, but we're making progress, real progress. Since, you know, with the internet, this is something beautiful and I love doing here on, on my show too, is, you know, how can we support you? Because there is some people, this this reaches people all around the world, Bill, and, and there, is, there must be some, uh, you know, who knows, this incredible I have, I, that I have on my website, um, a, uh, I think a, a, but, a button or something which, which, uh, uh, can take donations and if the donations are large enough then I can uh, well I'd have to be in contact with the person I can tell them how to write the check so that I can send it to uh, the Holos Institute for Health where Snor Sheely has and I have a uh, uh, I have an account there so that if they direct it to my psychoenergetic science research then uh, uh, Norm will write them back and they can take a tax write off from it but certainly people can uh, be part of this research yeah and also I guess helping to share your white paper results also yes. and the, the, the research that you have done all of that also contributes yes it does contribute I have I published a published a lot of work uh, in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine. They have been more open to alternative medicine because their work touches these new levels of reality. Yeah. So I'm, I'm speaking, it's it's difficult for some of the, uh, of the folks to understand this because they're tied uh, strongly to the orthodox, but still um, many do. They're willing to suffer a little confusion I think so Dr. Dr. Larry Dossey also publishes yes. in there. Uh, yes, but but there that would be good if Larry was um, not the person that's reading the if if Larry was the person that was reading the the uh, papers that are sent, but the person he has reading those papers is one who um, is. Uh, he has his own axe to grind. <laughs> Just put it that way. But I guess you're you're connected with Larry Dossey too, right? Uh, yeah, Larry and I uh, do once in a while communicate. We uh, uh, haven't talked to him in a long time, He's but wonderful. we're doing work now. I'm I'm having uh, starting a program on information medicine, um, which is psychoenergetic science applied to medicine. Um, and working with uh, the Buddha relics and doing experiments on the Buddha relics to show that uh, they, uh, they're very much like an intention host device and they are left behind by these Buddhist masters and they have consciousness and we can demonstrate that experimentally. So it really answers the, a, it is a answer to the question is there consciousness continuing after physical death? This the answer is, is yes. This is a beautiful book. I can totally see that as a book in itself. Yes, it will be eventually. We're doing more work. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Professor, for this uh, moment. Well, it was fun. <laughs> and I'm glad we were able to do this thanks to your friend, uh, Bill, <laughs> to do yes, this. Yes, yes. So I'm I'm glad to see you. When you when do you uh, take go back from your Vacation. Oh, I'm not on vacation. I'm here to interview uh, several people here on Maui ah, and then okay. Kauai and then uh, I'm going to the Quantum Medicine Congress in Honolulu okay. to interview Dr. Emoto and uh, it will be uh, it's a whole it's a whole trip. Well, it is. I mean, quantum is a real thing, but quantum mechanics cannot deal with the real stuff of humans. Not yet. Anyway, 
Thank you so much. My <laughs> pleasure. Good. Be well. You too. Hello and welcome to Conversations With, our monthly series of informal and enlightening conversations between the leading edge teacher and author, Jim Self, and some of today's most progressive and connected teachers, channels, and authors. Now, here's our host, Jim Self. Intention and attention are more potent than ever before because the consciousness and the applications are now much more available to us and becoming much more conscious to each one of us. When properly understood, clearly focused intention allows for more dynamic creation to occur almost instantaneously today. As a pioneer of the original intention experiments, Bill Tiller, a professor emeritus at Stanford University, has proven the focused intention has the power to transform the pH balance of water over thousands of miles. And now in collaboration with pediatric speech language pathologist Susie Miller, their autism intention experiment is proving that focused intention can create meaningful alterations in the behavior of children diagnosed with autism. Bill and I are going to talk today about 40 years of research in psychoenergetics and the power of intention to influence change. So why don't you start a little bit and talk about how you got here. I mean, as a scientific professor focused in, in material sciences and physics, how did you get to consciousness and intention? Fortunately, I received some money from a philanthropist in 1997 for a three-year program and I decided to put that money to work to seriously study the Descartes assumption of 1600. Descartes assumption which was really valuable at the time it was that no human qualities of consciousness intention emotion mind or spirit 
could significantly influence well-designed target experiment in physical reality. So this is and effectively the beginning of science. It, yes, exactly. And, and it was really a century after the beginning, after the, the Copernican Revolution, uh, all that uh, stuff that involved the beginning of Newton's work and Kepler and, uh, boy, like a senior moment, um, in Galileo, in, in Galileo yeah. was <laughs> what I was looking for. And <laughs> in essence, it was necessary for him to make this assumption because it allowed you to discriminate between religion and science. Now, there's no way of knowing whether it was true or not, but it was at that time, but it was a useful thing. And the dilemma in today's world is that that intention has been unconsciously held by orthodox science and orthodox medicine for the last 400 years. It still took another 100 years after the Descartes assumption before people really were able to make the transition from the theocratic uh, mindset that they had uh, grown used to. So since in all of that time, the last 400 years, this assumption had never been tested and it, and it was dominant in, in the conduct of orthodox science so i decided to test it i mean basically orthodox science decided that everything had to be internally self-consistent within a reference frame of distance time only in the study of nature and that was tough because even from the mid-1800s, there had been a lot of very good work by people studying what in those days um, would be called parapsychology. Sure. And basically, the Orthodox science community buried all of that because the data didn't fit their distance-time-only reference frame. So it became tough. I mean, Orthodox science has done great work and the reason that I decided to take this on was I felt that the other work was more important for humanity. That although the Orthodox science community is still doing very interesting work, I don't believe it is helping humankind develop themselves in the way I think they are meant to be developed. And it doesn't really provide the foundation needed for, I think, the new epoch that is underway. It started, it's not fully blown yet, but uh, it's already started. And so I did- Let me I, put this in perspective for a minute. Yep, so, yep. so effectively what Descartes did is he looked at how there was lots of extraneous influence, religion, politics, yep. and when you can remove the extraneous influence, you can come up with a pure, scientific experience that basically has hypothesis and then can prove the thesis. Exactly. But in the process of doing that, what he effectively has done is created a new religion yep. that eliminates all other possibilities as a contribution to finding truth. Yes, and the, the limitation was that distance time only as a reference frame which, of course, it was a it was a great step forward from the, the theocratic yeah. view. It is sure. a very limiting perspective of nature. Nature is broadcasting on many many bands, not just uh, the one that is distance time only. Well, and and of course it's not distance time. The only part is what becomes difficult. Distance time is an important piece in the the manifold expression of nature. And yes. we are now at a turning point to go and take the next step into a larger level of reality than just distance time. Yes. And distance yes. time, there's many serious pieces of work that are problems that come from this uh, distance time only perspective. and. All of them need to be recognized and needs 
need to be corrected. And that, yes. and that's really what the work is about. Is is really dealing with these things, recognizing where they have contributed, and recognizing where they are a serious limitation in today's world. Sure. So you've stepped into this space by adding, really kind of one of the most fundamental building blocks of creation, intention, and attention. And, and, and the issue is that in term, at, attention, of course, is has always been with us. The We have expanded the orthodox, today's orthodox reference frame to include both human intention as a significant experimental variable and human consciousness as a significant experimental variable. Yes. And this is going to change the future dramatically. And the work you're doing now is beginning to have scientific documented results that yes. can be peer reviewed uh, if can be objective. If, if it turns out that in the last 15 years, we have shown that it's possible to change the properties of a material, change the alkaline acidic balance of water, pH, up one or more pH units, or down one or more pH units from the same kind of water with no chemical additions. In the Orthodox community, that can be done, but only with chemical additions. So in our case, there's no, no new chemistry added other than intention. So if I look at your results as a scientist, I have to either deny them as crazy or shift my own belief system. That is true, exactly. And, and, and they would prefer at this point to call it crazy because, yes. you know, when you work with something in a belief system for such a long time, you it's very difficult to shift or easily shift to another belief system to accept data that you've denied for centuries so it's a slow process and it's unfortunate it is the way it is but the data will eventually cause the general public to force the government to cause these very excellent scientists to get off the pot and get outside the box and look at what else is there and I think that's going to happen in a very important and interesting way. Basically, you know, we've had back in, in June the experience of, hmm, again, another senior moment, but basically the Higgs boson work seems to have come to fruition after the last, oh, 40 years and it was proposed a long time ago, but that particular entity has been proposed to give mass to all the particles that we know about in nature, at least in the distance time only reference frame. Then that brings forth a kind of conclusion of the standard model of orthodox science, which in turn mean, and if that includes the Big Bang, but it, it deals with electromagnetic energy. And the thing we have to recognize is that all of our instruments, pretty much all of our instruments are based on electromagnetic energy, which have an upper limit of the velocity of electromagnetic light in vacuum. And our work seems to be indicating that as you go into the vacuum and beyond the physical vacuum into the higher dimensional aspects. All of these domains, the stuff of these domains, is superluminal. A superluminal means faster than electromagnetic light. And electromagnetic light is all subluminal, which is slower than the velocity of electromagnetic light. This is three times ten to the tenth centimeters per second velocity. So what the Orthodox community are going to find as they move forward, they will find that they, although the faster than light domain, our work has shown 
that is accessible and available to do new and interesting things, they will have no tools to do those things because the electromagnetic tools all go slower than the velocity of light. And the Big Bang aspect looks at the physical vacuum as being empty because, of course, we know that all our instruments, they look at the physical vacuum and, and their tr physical vacuum is transparent to the movement of electromagnetic energy. And it turns out that all, at all frequencies of electromagnetic energy, they go at the same constant velocity, which in, in our own eyesight, the vacuum looks transparent. So it's understandable to conclude that it's empty. However, there has been work by uh, John Wheeler, who's uh, passed now, but a very great astrophysicist, and he said that for quantum mechanics and relativity theory to be internally self-consistent, the vacuum had to have a latent energy density of 10 to the power 94 grams equivalent of electromagnetic mass. Well, that's huge. So that's something bigger than the, what is known. That is bigger in the following way. If you take if you take the cosmos as we know it, it's sort of the sphere of radius 15 billion light years, and you multiply it by the average electromagnetic mass density in stars and planets and cosmic dust, and that astronomers give us a number for that. So if we multiply those two together, we have an idea of what kind of energy content is available in our physical cosmos. On the other hand, if you take a single hydrogen atom, you take the volume of it, the hydrogen atom has one proton as the nucleus and it has one electron orbiting around it. But it's mostly empty space. If you take that incredibly small volume of empty space, and you multiply it by 10 to the 94 grams equivalent per cc, then you find that that stuff within the vacuum stuff of the volume of a single hydrogen atom is a trillion times larger than all of the mass in all of the stars and all of the planets and all the cosmic dust in our cosmos of radius 15 billion light years. Now, interesting really interesting okay let me give so you another more piece. going on <laughs> when another piece comes when Dirac did his work in the mid 20s to find out where an electron comes from he said it comes from an energy C a negative energy C in the physical vacuum now he said the way this comes about is an incoming photon interacts with the stuff of the physical vacuum and pumps out an electron into a higher energy state beyond the gap, band gap of energy, but it creates, leaves behind a hole in this stuff. And that hole became the antimatter. It was defined as that, was experimentally discovered in the 30s. We now have antimatter particles for every other particle that we've has been discovered by orthodox science. And the point I want to make is there would not be antimatter if the vac physical vacuum was empty. And then there are other things that show that it is not, the physical vacuum is not empty. And those calculations tend to show that there is stuff there, but it's going faster than the velocity of light. And so it does not interact with things going slower than the velocity of light. And that's why it, you can deduce that, oh, this thing is empty because it's not interacting with things. Well, it can't interact with it because it's going faster than light. Now, from our work, we have created what I think is a higher dimensional substance, which can go both slower than light and faster than light and can be a coupler between these two domains. And when you have the coupler, now 
you can begin to see the interaction. And thus you can begin to make measurements on things that appear to be going faster than light. Okay, so take, take that into the form of your experiment. All right. We did three, we learned eventually after, say, the initial 10 years of research in this area, we learned how to broadcast. We realized that we were dealing with what I call subtle energies. They are energies different than those found from the four fundamental forces in orthodox science. Those are gravity, electromagnetism, the short-range nuclear force, and the long-range nuclear force. So subtle energies, I proposed and published a sh short paper on that maybe 20 years ago. These are all the other energies functioning in nature beyond those that are in our orthodox toolbox. So I, I did four experiments to prove the, or disprove the Descartes assumption. Two of them had to do with pH. One with pH going up, one with pH going down. I had learned how to imprint an intention into a little electronic box that you could put together from the kinds of things you would get at Radio Shack in the 1950s. We talk about that a little bit. So how did you do that? How do you put a, a thought into an electrical box? Okay. The, it turns out someone else had created this kind of box, and I experimented with it. And I used four people who were longtime expert meditators. At this point, my wife and I have been meditating for almost 50 years. Uh, the two other people had been meditators at, at the time of those experiments also for 30 to 40 years. And so we would go into, well, first of all, we'd set up this black box on a uh, tabletop. We'd plug it into uh, an electrical plug. The electromagnetic radiation coming out of it was less than a millionth of a watt. So the place where we got the devices indicated from their studies. And we would then go into a deep meditative state. First, we would cohere ourselves as a group of four. And we would have the feeling of connectedness also to a deep level of a higher dimensional domain of reality, and that we would connect with these unseeing entities as well, these beings. But we thought of them, I thought of them as uh, my higher dimensional colleagues. And so we jointly would cohere, and I would then read the imprint statement that I'd created for the specific intention, and then we would hold that intention for uh, maybe maybe a half an hour. And when things felt cooked at that level of reality, and we, we thought of it as a sacred space, and we were trying to co-create in that sacred space, I would say, so be it, thy will be done. And tentatively come out of meditation and then give a short intention to seal the prime directive into the device so that it didn't leak away. We later found it, it was interesting. Once we'd imprinted the device, we call it an intention host device, an imprinted intention host device. I took an imprinted device and took an unimprinted one, separated them by about 100 meters, turned them both off electrically, and just waited because to see if anything happened. And you would expect, of course, nothing would happen because the electric power is off in both systems. But within three to five days, the imprint had been transferred from the imprinted device to the unimprinted device. And yet, there was no electrical connection. I first thought, heavens, I'll not be able to do any experiments because I'm losing the control. But I, then I realized, oh, wait a minute, these devices are off, so there's really another, at least one more information channel in nature 
through which information can pass. Yeah. And then I found that if I uh, stored the device in a fair electrical authority cage that was grounded and wrapped the device itself in aluminum foil and put it in the Faraday cage, it could keep it alive. The imprint in intention could be kept alive for maybe up to six months. So it meant that I could do experiments and I could ship a device to other people so they could do experiments, etc. So then we did these first the two pH experiments. The third experiment was to condition a space wherein this kind of creativity could take place. And then I took a liver enzyme, alkaline phosphatase, and just put it in that space for 30 minutes, first of all, before that, measuring its chemical activity, put it in the intention statement in that case was to increase the chemical activity by exposure to a conditioned space. And then, so it was in there for 30 minutes, took it out and, and experimentally measured it, and indeed the chemical activity had been increased by almost 30%, and the p-value, that is the probability that it happened by random chance was less than one, one chance in a thousand, which is really robust experimental results. The final, the fourth experiment was to take a living system, fruit fly larva, and to put them in uh, an agar solution, I mean, on the top of that solution so that they had food, we were conditioning the space continually through the lifetime of the fruit fly larva. The goal was to increase the ATP to ADP, that is the energy storage molecule for the fruit fly larva. It has three phosphorus atoms, whereas the chemical precursor had only two phosphorus atoms, and so our intention was to add a third phosphorus atom to this ADP. And we found that we were able to do that to the amount of 10 to 15 percent, again with p-values better than 0 0.001. And we thought that that would make the fruit fly larva become more physically fit and therefore have a shorter larval development time to the adult fly stage. And in fact, we found that we were able to reduce the larval development time to the adult fly stage by pretty close to 25% with p-values better than 0 0.001. So okay, those so four me, experiments me... were so remarkable, they proved unequivocally that in today's world at least, the Descartes assumption is no longer holds. So the assumption is Descartes is correct in some aspect of it, but when you begin to inject another aspect of, in this case, consciousness and intention, you alter the foundation Ab of absolutely. the experiment. Absolutely. The ball, the ball game is definitely changed. And yeah, whether the yeah. Descartes experiment held in the old days or not, we'll never know. But at least in today's world, mm -hmm. it does not hold. But it is still stuck in the subconscious of the Orthodox community, the medical community, in universities around the world, and in the supporters. What I know in all of the Mastering Alchemy work is that the barriers, uh, you know, some people call them the veils between consciousness, but as this third dimensional electromagnetic field that we've been exposed to forever has changed. We've moved out of that field. That's my work, my awareness. No, but I, I quite that, agree. I mean, the, the other fields were always there. But they could yes. not be accessed Access. from, from yes. distance time. Right. So one of the really exciting things about what you're doing in terms of kind of scientifically proving it and, and moving the direction of science to begin to include a spiritual alignment, which will happen very yes. soon as this unfolds, and a lot of it is directly related to what kind of you're doing. but. The scientific community in this case, just like the political community, the religious community, are usually the last ones to go. You know, they're the leader and they have to now catch up to who they're leading. And I, so, I think but that's, the, that's exactly the case. Yeah, but the public is, and 
people who are listening understand this in, in very clear ways because they're not encumbered by the prove it and the lines of restriction that that third dimensional reality has happened. And I think you're going to begin to see some really tremendous